In a recent hearing, Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC Chairman Gary Gensler, reiterated that the regulator is looking to crack down on just about every cryptocurrency besides BTC. Gary also revealed more details about the criteria the SEC is using to crack down on crypto projects and even revealed who is behind all the recent ESG-related regulations. Today, I'm going to summarize what Gary said during his testimony, give you some additional context about his comments, and tell you what they could mean for the crypto market. The hearing I'll be summarizing today is titled, quote, Oversight of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. It was organized by the United States Senate Banking Committee, which consists of politicians from both sides of the aisle. A link to the full hearing will be in the description if you need it. I'll also note that the hearing took place on the same day that Ethereum transitioned from proof-of-work to proof-of-stake, and that the last time Gary testified to US politicians was in September last year. We summarized what he said back then too, and the link to that video will also be in the description. Now, the hearing began with opening statements from the most senior Democrat and Republican politicians present. The first to go was Senator Sherrod Brown, who is the chairman of the Senate Banking Committee. Sherrod started with a simple fact, and that's that the average person doesn't measure the economy by the performance of the stock market. I reckon you could argue that retirees do, but let's not split hairs. Sherrod went on to list all the things that the average person uses to measure the economy, including employment and the like. He then went off on some odd tangent about hedge funds, quote, stretching their tentacles into the economy. I must admit that he sort of lost me at that part. Sherrod then addressed the SEC directly and said that any complaints about the SEC from the other side of the aisle are unjustified because the SEC is just doing its job. Sherrod said the SEC must continue its aggressive enforcement actions and said that US politicians are in the process of putting together a bill to stop insider trading by politicians. Note that they're tabling this bill as the world enters what is likely to be a global recession meaning stocks won't do well anyways. Regarding crypto, Sherrod cited US President Joe Biden's executive order about cryptocurrency and said that all cryptos that the SEC classifies as securities should be crushed, basically. He also spent quite a bit of time talking about illicit finance, scams, and all that other stuff anti-crypto politicians like to focus on. Interestingly, Sherrod says he supports a crypto bill recently introduced by Senators Debbie Stabenow and John Boozman. Where do they get these names from, I wonder? Now, I say interestingly because the bill in question would protect ETH from the SEC's wrath by giving significant authority over it and other cryptos to the CFTC, another markets regulator. This is significant because Gary told reporters after the hearing that proof-of-stake cryptocurrencies could be securities. Recall that this is the same day that Ethereum transitioned from proof-of-work to proof-of-stake. Sherrod finished his opening statement by touching on almost every financial topic under the sun. He said the SEC needs to make sure investors are protected from crypto, pushed for climate disclosures, called for the scrutiny of stock buybacks, and even managed to talk about the Inflation Reduction Act. You know, that little $740 billion spending package yeah, that Inflation Reduction Act. Anyways, next up was Senator Pat Toomey, who is second in command at the committee. Pat started by saying that the SEC's recent actions are inconsistent with its mandate to protect investors, facilitate capital formation, and maintain orderly and efficient markets. Pat pointed to the SEC's handling of crypto platforms as an example and asked Gary why it didn't go after Celsius and Voyager Digital when it went after BlockFi last year. As many of you will know, both Celsius and Voyager Digital filed for bankruptcy earlier this year, leaving billions in user crypto in limbo. Pat went on to blast the SEC for not clarifying crypto regulations, namely when it comes to its definition of decentralization. For reference, former SEC director Bill Hinman famously said that ETH was not a security because Ethereum is, quote, 
sufficiently decentralized. Pat also explained that the intermediaries in cryptocurrency are not the same as those you find in the traditional financial system. That's because many of the so-called intermediaries are automatically executing smart contracts on decentralized blockchains. They are not financial middlemen. Pat even went as far as arguing that there should be a completely new regulatory framework for cryptocurrency, as most coins and tokens aren't consistent with 100-year-old securities laws. Pat then turned his attention to the SEC's proposed climate disclosures, which could increase annual compliance costs for companies by up to 5x. He highlighted the fact that the SEC's own calculations suggest climate disclosures will make listing a new stock on an exchange five times more expensive as well. Citing these facts, Pat stated that climate disclosures have nothing to do with informed investment. They are about the ESG investing ideology. Pat cautioned that embracing ESG means the United States will end up like Europe, i.e. not having any energy because of underinvestment in oil and gas. More about that in the description. Pat added that the ESG push from regulators like the SEC is, quote, doing damage to the economy, causing inflation, potentially harming national security. As such, he warned Gary that the SEC will find itself face-to-face -face with the Supreme Court if it continues to disregard the valid concerns of politicians. And with those tense words hanging in the air, it was Gary's turn. His opening statement was surprisingly short, and he started by thanking the politicians present for approving two new commissioners to the SEC. More about that later. Gary went on to claim that securities laws in the United States are the new gold standard, not figuratively, but literally. Gary said that the gold standard was abandoned and securities laws became the new gold standard. Good joke, haha. -ha. In all seriousness, Gary's crazy claim does make some sense because securities like stocks are effectively how the average person has protected their purchasing power since the US went off the gold standard. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt and assume this is what he was getting at. Now, what's interesting is that Gary proceeded to talk about the plumbing of the stock market and how it has not been updated in 17 years. He mentioned that the inner workings of treasury markets are likewise outdated. Now, this is interesting because it implies that the SEC wants to completely revamp these systems, and I suspect that the upcoming global recession will present the perfect opportunity to do so. It'll also present the perfect opportunity for regulators and anti-crypto politicians to paint cryptocurrency as a scapegoat to justify a crackdown. More about that in the description. I digress. Gary finished by saying that almost every one of the 10,000 cryptocurrencies in existence is a security. He added that any attempts at creating unique regulations for crypto would, quote, undermine the $100 trillion securities market that the SEC oversees. In other words, it would take control of crypto away from the SEC, and that's something that Gary and the anti-crypto politicians who put him in his position do not want. No, sir. Anyhow, after the opening statements came the question period, and Senator Sherrod Brown was again the first to go. Sherrod started with a couple of minor questions and then commented that there was an abnormally high number of politicians present, particularly from the red side of the aisle. This suggests that this was a very high-stakes hearing, and you'll see why that might be in just a few moments. Sherrod then asked Gary about why climate disclosures are so important, and Gary admitted that they are important because it's what the institutional investors are demanding. Now, if you watched our video about ESG and cryptocurrency, you'll know that BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager, and Bank of America, one of the largest banks, are two of the architects of ESG. They've also been coercing other institutions to comply with ESG, and apparently that includes regulators. Sherrod also asked Gary about that aforementioned bill that would give significant oversight of cryptocurrency to the CFTC. Not surprisingly, Gary said he doesn't want multiple agencies creating crypto definitions, which is code for, we want to be the only ones regulating crypto. 
Next up, of course, was Senator Pat Toomey, who asked Gary point blank about whether decentralization is something the SEC considers when assessing whether a cryptocurrency is a security. Gary responded by saying that what the SEC focuses on are the expectations of profit coming from an identifiable third party. This is actually consistent with the arguments in recent crypto enforcement actions by the SEC. The regulator is hypersensitive to any kind of crypto promotion. Expecting this response, Pat followed up with a logical question, and that's whether it's possible to identify the origin of an expectation of profit for a crypto that's decentralized. Gary fumbled his response and then said, quote, I am being careful with my words here. Realizing that Gary dared not say the words sufficiently decentralized, Pat asked Gary why BTC is not a security. Naturally, Gary responded by saying, it's because Bitcoin is decentralized. Pat said, this is proof the SEC is factoring decentralization into its crypto decisions. Gary fired back by saying that there are many other criteria in the SEC's crypto decisions and clarified that it doesn't matter if a coin or token is technologically decentralized. If there are one or more entities driving an expectation of profit, then it's a security in the SEC's eyes. This is pretty concerning because, again, the SEC's recent enforcement actions suggest the regulator is very sensitive to any kind of crypto promotion. This means interviews with crypto founders and even announcements from companies behind crypto projects could be enough to justify enforcement. Pat went on to criticize the SEC for not providing any kind of roadmap or guidance for entities in the crypto industry. Gary responded by saying, the SEC is in active discussions with these entities and said nobody will trust cryptocurrency unless there is investor protection. Now, the next senator to ask questions was John Tester, and this is where things got especially uh, testy. John started by saying that he's a farmer and a believer in climate change as it has affected him personally. Even so, he is extremely concerned about the SEC's proposed climate disclosures. Gary explained that the climate disclosures the SEC is proposing only apply to publicly traded companies. This was met with skepticism by John, who pointed out that the SEC's climate disclosures could still apply to regular private companies due to something called Scope 3 emissions. Now, Scope 3 emissions requires publicly traded companies to essentially include any emissions that lie upstream or downstream from their actual operations. In this case, John's private farm provides wheat to publicly traded companies. He could therefore be forced to disclose climate-related information. This would significantly increase the cost of compliance for private companies, especially privately owned farms, which are entwined with publicly traded agriculture companies. John went back and forth with Gary about this, with Gary insisting the SEC isn't trying to increase costs for small companies. As it so happens, crushing small companies is exactly what these climate disclosures are about. This was revealed in an ESG discussion at the World Economic Forum's Davos meeting earlier this year. The panelists literally said they want to eliminate small businesses and integrate them into their global corporations. Sounds like some nightmarishly capitalist form of collectivization to me, the worst of both worlds. Now, as far as I can tell, this is why Gary's hearing had so many politicians present. Many politicians have small businesses, just like John Tester, so these climate disclosures affect them personally. Note that this appeared to be a big concern on both sides of the aisle, contrary to Sherrod Brown's comments. And speaking of partisanship, Senator Tom Tillis started his question period with a witty comment. It was something along the lines of, quote, Sherrod, you asked for a bellyache from the other side of the aisle. I am here to deliver. Tom then turned to Gary and asked why the SEC only provided a single page telling Tom and his associates to meet with SEC commissioners when they asked about something. This was a not-so-subtle way of asking Gary why the SEC is ignoring the requests of one of the political parties. Gary again fumbled his response, so Tom pivoted to another topic. 
Tom asked Gary why the SEC wants to tighten the screws on the treasury market by requiring regular investors to register as brokers with the SEC. If that flew over your head, the treasury market refers to the market for US government debt. Now, a broker is an individual or institution who is registered with the SEC to offer securities trading, in this case, US government debt. Gary answered by saying that the only entities that would be forced to register with the SEC as brokers are those who trade more than $25 billion of US government debt every month. That doesn't sound like much, but it's a low limit for, say, pension funds, private offices and other such enterprises. This is why Tom pressed Gary on what effects this kind of regulation would have on such enterprises, and Gary once again failed to provide a clear answer. If you ask me, this is just another excuse to crush small companies so that larger players can claim their assets and customer base. Now, after a few questions from Senator Bob Menendez, Senator John Kennedy took his turn. Now, some of you may recall that the last time John and Gary went head-to-head, John asked Gary if he thought he was everyone's daddy. Unfortunately, the exchange wasn't nearly as entertaining this time around because John spent half the time talking about the SEC's crackdown on Chinese stocks. John spent the other half of his time coming back to the climate disclosures. He asked Gary how much the SEC estimates the costs of compliance to be for small businesses, citing John Tester's concerns. Gary didn't have an answer. John then asked Gary whether the fundamental purpose of climate disclosures is to fight climate change. The answer is obviously yes, but Gary explained that the SEC's role is just to ensure that investors are getting the disclosures they're looking for. John followed up with a request for Gary, and that's for the SEC to estimate how much all the money being spent on compliance by small businesses will reduce climate change. Something tells me that this won't be possible to calculate. John added that he's sceptical the costs will be worth the effect, given that China gets 60% of its energy from coal and will continue polluting regardless of how much the US crushes small businesses with climate disclosures. Fair points, in my opinion. After a few more questions from Senator Chris Van Hollen, Senator Catherine Cortez Mastow took her turn. She asked Gary why the SEC hasn't gone after cryptocurrency exchanges yet. Gary responded by reiterating that most cryptos are securities due to expectations of profits coming from developers. Gary continued by claiming that there's lots of front-running and market manipulation on cryptocurrency exchanges and alleging that crypto exchanges are not being compliant with the SEC. This might have something to do with the fact that every crypto exchange that has tried to approach the SEC has received an enforcement action rather than any regulatory guidance. Not helping, Gary. Not helping. Catherine also touched on ESG-related climate disclosures and asked Gary about concerns around greenwashing. Gary confirmed that ESG-obsessed institutional investors are concerned about greenwashing, hence why the SEC is looking to enforce new climate disclosures on companies. The next senator to take a turn was Mike Rounds. Mike threw his weight behind John Tester's climate disclosure concerns and told Gary that the SEC seriously needs to re-examine this regulation. Gary insisted that it will only apply to public companies, which you'll know isn't entirely correct. Mike then turned to the topic of cryptocurrency and said it's unacceptable that the SEC has been regulating cryptocurrency for five years without providing any regulatory clarity, nor a roadmap for such clarity. Mike went as far as to say that it doesn't make any sense given Gary's background. I suspect this was a bit tongue-in-cheek because Gary spent most of his career at Goldman Sachs. If you watched our video about the enemies of cryptocurrency, you'll know that many entities on Wall Street want crypto to be integrated with their financial system. They do not want competition. Mike also underscored the fact that the SEC has responded with enforcement when crypto companies come and ask it for guidance. Believe it or not, but Gary said, and I quote, not liking the answer doesn't mean there isn't guidance. I mean, what? Mike then laid out a few facts at Gary's feet. The SEC has proposed 32 new regulations over the past year and continues to propose new regulations. These regulations are being applied to the same sectors 
without consideration for how they might interact and overlap. Why isn't the SEC addressing this? Well, believe it or not, but Gary told Mike that he has his cell phone number, so just give him a call. Why do I have the feeling that Gary's phone will go to voicemail when Mike's number appears? Anywho, the next senator to take the stand was Tina Smith, and she asked Gary why climate disclosures are important. This is where Gary revealed more details about the institutional investors who are pushing for these climate disclosures and how they are applying pressure to the SEC. For context, whenever the SEC or another government agency is considering a new regulation, they typically put out a request for comment. What Gary revealed in his response to Tina is that these comments are apparently ranked according to the assets under management of the respondents. Specifically, Gary said that the, quote, top two or three hundred comments to the SEC's proposed climate disclosures rule came from institutional investors who manage a whopping $50 trillion in assets. Note that this is about half of the size of the $100 trillion equities market, as per Gary's earlier statistic. As you might have guessed, most of these institutional investors were in favor of ESG-related disclosures, such as the climate disclosures proposed by the SEC. I always suspected that these requests for public comments were intended for such institutions and not for individuals. It's nice to get that confirmation. On that note, you should know that this massive concentration of wealth only began around the time the US went off the gold standard. Were it not for the money printing of the central bank, these institutions would not have the kind of influence over financial regulations that they have today. Now, the next senator to take the stand was none other than her right high awesomeness, Cynthia Lummis, who many of you will know is incredibly pro-crypto. She talked a bit about the crypto bill she drafted with Senator Kirsten Gillibrand and thanked Gary for the SEC's continued cooperation in guiding the bill's evolution. Cynthia then asked Gary about disclosures in cryptocurrency and he talked about the importance of disclosures for sponsors, promoters and entrepreneurs in cryptocurrency. A timely talking point given the recent lawsuit against a crypto YouTuber over his alleged sales of unregistered securities. Cynthia finished her segment by telling Gary that she and Kirsten want to continue working with him to clarify crypto regulation. She also revealed that their crypto bill will be reintroduced with some amendments early next year. We will be sure to cover that when it comes out, fear not. While you wait, you can check out our existing summary of Cynthia's pro-crypto bill, and that will be down in the description. Now, the next senator to take the stand was John Ossoff, who I will forever remember as the politician who grilled Fed Chairman Jerome Powell about why central banks have been printing money since 2008. John asked Gary what his rationale is for forcing regular treasury investors to register as brokers if their trading volume exceeds a certain amount. Gary said that this regulation will increase competition, presumably because so many of these regular investors will be forced to sign on as brokers. In practice, however, I suspect that many of them will simply opt to close up shop, just like the wolves on Wall Street want. Senator John Haggerty continued the offensive by saying Gary's claim that securities laws in the United States are a gold standard is blatantly false. The reality is that US markets have been choked by securities regulations and companies are moving overseas or choosing to stay private. Note that this is the case in cryptocurrency. John continued his attack by arguing that ESG disclosures will make things worse, more regulation will result in a slow death, and at the end of the day, there will be no investors left to protect. John then sternly asked Gary what his motivations are for his excessive regulation. Gary didn't have a clear answer. After an incomprehensive set of questions from Senator Mike Warner, Senator Steve Daines took his turn, or so he thought. His microphone wasn't working, and Senator Sherrod Brown promised the other side of the aisle didn't do it on purpose. Once he found a mic that worked, Steve slammed the SEC's climate disclosures rule as being, quote, beyond unreasonable. He went over all the issues with calculating scope 3 emissions 
and ask Gary whether the SEC will be asking small businesses whether their employees are driving Tesla cars. Incredibly, Gary responded by saying there are many companies disclosing these details already and that all the SEC wants to do is introduce a standard for these disclosures. Gary reiterated that the intention is not to go after small businesses. Steve took this as the opportunity to ask Gary whether small businesses would therefore be exempt from such disclosures, and Gary just continued talking about all the public comments the SEC got from institutional investors. Realising that the answer was no, Steve stressed that he doesn't want the United States to end up like Europe or the state of California, which is also facing energy issues, among other things. Gary explained that the European Union's climate disclosures will apply to US companies, so they will have to disclose this information either way. What's hilarious is Steve responded with, quote, Well, I wish them good luck with that. Let's pray that Europe has energy this winter. Next up was Senator Jack Reed, who brought up a completely new topic that I must mention. That's that the accounting firms that do the accounting for large corporations are the same accounting firms that audit them. Jack asked Gary what the SEC was doing to ensure there wasn't corruption in accounting. Gary gave a general response about new regulations that will ensure the independence of accounting firms, but Jack wasn't impressed. He pointed out that accounting firms have already been caught doing shady stuff, yet this shady activity is not disclosed publicly. It's kept behind the closed doors of the SEC. Jack asked Gary when the SEC would disclose exactly what these accounting firms are up to before the timer ran out. I would have loved to hear an answer there because the big accounting firms also happen to be heavily involved in ESG. Who knows what shenanigans they've been up to. Then came Senator Elizabeth Warren, who many of you will know is probably the most anti-crypto politician in the entire galaxy. Surprisingly, she spent no time talking about crypto. Instead, she talked about the importance of climate disclosures, specifically Scope 3 emissions. Now, to be honest, Elizabeth's speech was really helpful in understanding just how ridiculous the SEC's climate disclosures are. Elizabeth revealed that under Scope 3 emissions, the emissions that come from the fuel in your car would be counted towards the emissions of the company that produced the fuel. Madness. This begs the question of whether individuals could get caught up in climate disclosures. Given that the ESG crowd are working on individualised ESG scores, it's certainly not out of the question. Now, the last senator to take the stand was good old Pat Toomey. He started by saying that it's clear some regulators are pushing political agendas, and he counts the SEC in that category. Pat went on to explain that the SEC's climate disclosure rule requires congressional authority due to its scope. Pat asked Gary if the SEC has considered rescinding its proposed climate disclosures rules, to which Gary essentially said no. That is when Pat warned that if the SEC goes ahead with its climate disclosure rule, Gary and the gang will find themselves face-to-face with an unsympathetic Supreme Court. Mic drop. So, this brings me to the big question, and that's what Gary's testimony means for cryptocurrency. I'll start by saying that so long as Gary is around, no crypto is safe except BTC. Even then, the SEC's climate disclosure rules could significantly increase costs for crypto miners, which could have second-order effects on Bitcoin. Now, if you're wondering how long Gary could remain as sheriff of SECville, I'm afraid it will be until at least 2026. This is coincidentally around the time the top of the next bull market will be. I predict that one of the first things the next SEC chair could do is approve a spot Bitcoin ETF, and this could mark the actual cycle top for BTC. Until that time, We will have the pleasure of experiencing an SEC consisting of commissioners who are politically aligned with anti-crypto interests, Hester Pierce notwithstanding. I expect to see lots of enforcement actions against crypto projects and crypto companies. To be blunt, it's going to be a bloodbath, and any crypto entities in the United States will be at an especially high risk of regulation. The silver lining in all of this is that politicians on both sides of the aisle are becoming increasingly sceptical of the SEC. 
This must be the first time I've seen politicians from both parties scrutinise Gary so severely, and it probably won't be the last. I can't imagine he's in a hurry to go back. Depending on the outcome of the upcoming midterm elections, we could very well see politicians vote to put Gary in the hot seat, i.e. in front of the Supreme Court. I think it's clear to everyone that Scope 3 emissions take climate disclosures one step too far, and there will be huge problems if they're implemented. The real question is, what will happen when the rest of the ESG web starts to unravel? Climate disclosures are just a piece of the puzzle that's being slowly put together by institutional investors. More and more people are starting to see what the final picture looks like, and they don't like it one bit. Now, don't get me wrong, addressing environmental, social and governance issues is important, but any solution that requires a top-down, centralised approach is bound to do more harm than good. History has shown us this time and time again. The best way to address these and other issues is from the bottom up. This is why the World Economic Forum is leveraging its massive network of young global leaders and global shapers to make sure the Great Reset is a success. With some luck, crypto will come up with the tools to combat these genetically modified grassroots movements with organic, community-driven initiatives. You can learn more about what the WEF is planning and the power of crypto governance using the links in the description. And that's all for today's video about Gary Gensler's recent testimony. If you found it informative, let me know by smashing that like button. If you want to make sure you don't miss my next crypto summary, subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell. While you wait, you can check out Coin Bureau Clips for more awesome crypto content and tune in to the Coin Bureau podcast for in-depth crypto discussions. You can also follow me on Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram for hot takes and memes, and join my Telegram channel for daily crypto market updates. If you're wondering what comes next for the crypto market, you can subscribe to my weekly newsletter to get my personal crypto market predictions, along with a breakdown of my personal crypto portfolio. And if you want to support the channel, head on over to the Coin Bureau merch store and cop yourself some crypto merch that will keep you warm. You can find your way there using the link in the description. As always, thank you for watching, and I will see you next time. Till then, stay cool, stay safe, and stay crypto.